some of it is four off. <laughs> but I think the lures of the, the lure of the trees got up going and uh, ended up at the University of Missouri getting a master's in forestry column with a very own Tom Pickley, for Tom right there, and after Tom was at the zoo. Uh -huh. From there he went to Cornell, where he was PhD, started his academic career at the other UW, the one in Madison, great town by the way, uh, where he went through the assistant associate professor ranks before moving to the University of Minnesota in 1991. Uh, where he's been ever since. He holds a number of distinguished professorships. Uh, it's too challenging for me to summarize Peter's research and the depth and the breadth of this. I'll just simply say that Peter works on uh, global environmental change and his effect on terrestrial ecosystems. I'll let Peter go from there. Uh, he's a very prolific writer, well over 600 papers in his career, uh, over 95,000 citations, and at least 15 papers that have been cited at least a thousand times. And uh, not surprisingly, he was elected to the National Academy of Science last year. And when I heard the news, I have to admit, my first reaction was, was it Peter already giving me that? <laughs> so it was certainly an honor, well, well earned. Uh, please join me in welcoming Peter and uh, his seminar, Taking Nature's Pulse on the Changing Planet. What, what have we learned and what do we need to, need to do next? Thanks, Peter. Thanks so much. And the invitation because really it's you who kind of set this in motion for getting me to come here and chat. And it's great to meet many new people here and also people I've met before, including Laura Crew, who worked with me at Cedar Creek, uh, well, it was only three or four years ago, but, <laughs> and Tom uh, Hinkley and others I've known in the past. So I decided to do something a little bit different with my talk today. Rather than just talking about the science, which I can get excited about, it might be boring to some of you. I'm also going to talk a little bit about being a scientist, especially in this era of change and political change, political times. And so that's why I titled my talk, Taking Nature's Pulse on a Changing Planet, What Have We Learned and What Do We Do Next? Uh, and I'd like to keep this conversation at all possible, so please feel free to raise your hand and shout out a question along the way or comments or something. Um, I'd be happy to do that. So on the left, bunch of standard pictures of the way in which we're changing the world. We've seen variations on these over and over again. And the right are kind of cartoon examples of experiments, observations, and models that we as scientists use to try to understand the way in which these changes are impacting uh, ecosystems. And if I was just thinking about the science of it, then you know those experiments, and ones like this in Australia that I'll talk about a little later, would be enough to talk about. But we're interested in stewarding nature, sustaining both people and the planet. And so I'm also going to talk today about whether and how we can make positive change. And the big question mark there, because I don't think I have. Um, I think I've done science. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about this in the last 5, 10, 15 years in science, about whether scientists should also be involved in politics or advocacy or in some sense, pushing for change, other than being quote unquote impartial scientists. And here's something you might want to read. It came out recently in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution by two authors who argue not only that we must act on our own warnings to humanity, but they're actually saying we should be engaged in civil disobedience. Um, so I think it's very interesting to think about that. what are our roles in society today as scientists given all the myriad ways in which society and the Earth is changing around us. I don't have the answer, um, but I think it's something worth thinking about. And we can each make our own decision about how we go forward with that. So the climate change is the reason why we're worried about all these things. And I borrowed this cartoon from a colleague who stole it from the internet and it modified it some. Uh, so it's kind of a tutorial on climate science 101, which I think actually captures everything I would want to say today or in class. You know, it's warming, it's us, and it's bad. One, two, and three, and there's unequivocal evidence for all of those. But the good news is that we can fix it, and there's equally unequivocal evidence that we can do that. And so, we just have to do it. It's not, it doesn't require any new technology, it just requires us to, to get off the bus and actually make these changes. Now, in my uh, job as a researcher, I focus on probably these three aspects of it, with the vast majority of my work, focusing on the way in which these changes are influencing terrestrial ecosystems. 
I don't talk about that in most of the talk today, but also in my teaching and outreach and as a private citizen, I try to be engaged in all of these, um, not as much as I should or could, um, but that's something I felt I'm driven to do more and more. Maybe I should have done more of it, less research along the way, given the importance of making changes, at least in my opinion. But when we start with the science part of this, I'm going to spend 40 or so minutes talking about taking nature's pulse. And these are some of the tools uh, that I use and many others use. Uh, basically use concepts and theories, experiments, observations, and models. And I put the concepts and theories in a different color, green color here, because they're not really a separate category. They kind of are the underpinning for how we set up and run and interpret our experiments, observations, and models that really are woven through all of that. And hopefully I will show a little bit of that in the next little while. So when I get down focused a little more on the work I've been involved in, most, most of it's involved in looking at the way in which global change, represented here by CO2 and climate, influence plants and ecosystems to address questions such as whether our ecosystems will retain their functional integrity under global change. But just as important, and just as much part of the cycle, is whether the changes in those plants and ecosystems driven by our global environmental changes will feed back and influence the global carbon cycle and either amplify or dampen climate change, which is a big deal as well. And so a lot of the work I've done tries to look at one or both parts of these loops. And of course, very complicated when you look at the whole world. I'm only going to touch upon some small fraction of that. And the reason this is all so important is uh, what happens to this carbon. And this helps me think about the importance of these carbon cycles and land carbon sinks in particular. Uh, over a decadal scale of the 100% of the fossil fuel emission, excuse me, of the cumulative carbon emissions we put in the air, roughly 90% come from burning fossil fuels and 10% from debt land use changes driven by deforestation. And of course, immediately 100% of that CO2 is in the air, but at an annual or decadal scale, only about 40, 40, 44% of it stays in the atmosphere, and the oceans and land ecosystems uh, take up. 56% of it. And so more than half of the junk we put in the atmosphere are scrubbed out of the air by land and ocean processes and have been for 150 years. And it's a good thing because the Earth has already warmed one degree C since 1900. Without those sinks on land and ocean, the Earth would have already warmed two to three degrees C. Um, and so the really big question is, can this multi-trillion dollar ecosystem service persist? Because there's many reasons why oceanic land sinks might get smaller. Um, A, because we don't have six hours, and B, because I don't know much about the oceans. I'm going to uh, not talk about them any further today. Um, but I will focus on what I do know about uh, terrestrial land sinks. So I mentioned <coughs> concepts in theory are underpinning for how we look at experiments, observations, and models. And there are many, many uh, concepts and theory that underpin my work and the work of many others who work in the field. Everything from multiple resource limitation theory to tra trade-offs to ecological stoichiometry, uh, which also half grew out of the University of Minnesota, Bob Sterner, competition, biodiversity, ecosystem function, et cetera, et cetera. And as I've been involved particularly in developing the trade trade-off concepts and ideas. I'm going to touch a little bit about those. Now, just to get us on the same page, uh, trait, it, according to these definitions here, is a morphological, physiological, phenological feature measurable at an individual community or ecosystem level. We tend to think about it at the level of, of leaves or wood or roots, but you can also think about it from a whole plant or an ecosystem perspective. Leaf area index can be considered a property uh, that's a trait of an ecosystem. And the whole kind of raison d'etre about trait-based ecology, which I do feel I've helped start, is that this field of subfield of ecology studies how the structure and function of communities, ecosystems, and landscapes emerges from the functional properties of individual organisms and both the mean of those traits, like the mean of all the leaves of a dug fir monoculture, or the diversity of traits, as in a diverse forest or grassland, those matter to the way in which that ecosystem 
uh, is structured and operates, including its carbon cycling. And you can think of this as an alternative to a species-based approach. So if you're studying a, your backyard the size of this room, and you know every species in it, whether it's a, a meadow or a forest, and you know a lot about the life history and physiology of the species, you can say, oh yeah, the duck fur is growing there because of this, it's growing faster than that species because of that. But you can't translate that knowledge to a patch of ground the size 300 miles away or half a world away. But if you know that the duck fur grows faster than this other plant because it has different wood density or different chemistry, and those contrasts and attributes and relations hold elsewhere, then you can start to think about the way in which other systems operate with a common currency. And that's what traits do. It eliminates the need to have this, my backyard is unique, and I have to understand every species. And instead, you can try to have quantitative measures of, of plants or plant parts or ecosystems that tell us a lot about how they operate. At least that's the idea. And hopefully I'll show you at least one example of why that does work. And we've taken this uh, uh, theory about traits and processes and tried to see how well it worked at organ scale, not just leaves, but also roots and wood, at the scale of individuals, at the scale of communities and ecosystems, and even in terms of its response to global change. And I'll probably give at least one example of each of these in the next uh, time here. So, the world's a big place, it's a beautiful place, there's all sorts of ecosystems uh, on land that have different kinds of species, different amounts of species, different climates, different soils, a lot, a heck of, a lot of diversity, and of course there's uh, all sorts of, of plants with different types of leaves uh, across all the systems. And if you're trying to think about processes not just in one area, but for the whole world, this trait-based approach might be useful, and so we started testing ideas about this decades ago, and it's kind of a, uh, you can think of it as a variation of RK strategy, but it's actually a bit different, but the ideas have some commonalities, and the idea is of a, a fast versus a slow strategy where you can either allocate your resources so that you are productive and, and grow fast, but if you do that, you're likely to not be well defended and uh, in the face of biotic and abiotic stress, or you can hunker down and build something that's really well defended but it's likely not to grow very fast because you've allocated all those resources to persistence. And that the idea is that maybe this is some kind of uh, inviolable trade-off. Um, and we actually have quite a bit of evidence for that. At multiple scales, we're going to show at the leaf scale. This is the data from our first several hundred species um, back in the 1990s from our own data in the literature, where the rate of photosynthesis of the species uh, was related to the longevity of the leaves. What we saw is that the uh, plants whose leaves uh, photosynthesize most rapidly don't live very long and have to be replaced, which is very expensive. It's like replacing your furnace uh, every few months versus every 50 or 100 months. Whereas the other extreme, uh, plants that are able to keep their leaves and not have to replace them for a long time have to suffer from having a low rate of productivity from those. And so we thought of this as kind of the, the tortoise and the hare, where the species with a fast uh, pace of life syndrome, such as Quaking Aspen in Minnesota, are more of the hares, and species such as the uh, white spruce in Minnesota that has a long lived leaves with low productivity are the tortoises. And we've tested whether this is true in many, many different systems, and it holds up 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, we first extended this work with Ian Wright from Macquarie University in, in 175 sites in a series of papers. The first was in a Nature paper in 2004, um, in which we tracked whether or not these relationships uh, about multiple leaf trade-offs held in different ecosystems, and they did held no matter whether you're in a, a rainforest or a tundra or a grassland. And then we further extended it with the uh, advent of the Tri Network, and I was involved in developing both of these, these uh, trade networks, uh, which is run by Jens Kaki from the Max Planck Institute, um, which now has more than 7 million records and 150,000 taxa. And we found exactly the same thing when we look at all the data here. So there's early ideas about trade trade-offs hold, uh, and they are something generalizable across all land ecosystems. And people are now extending them to bacteria and fungi, and people already had similar ideas about uh, animal ecology. Now, so 
at least at the level of the, of the individual trait, uh, individual organs it holds, what about when you're trying to explain the dynamics of ecosystems? We did one test here with Joe Wright at, at the famous BCI 50 hectare plot, where he had amazing data for 360,000 individuals tracked uh, over more than 20 years. So we asked whether this fast versus slow trade-off could explain the long-term dynamics of this tropical forest. Uh, Joe's amazing. Here we get a chance to go, go in the forest with him. He's like a walking museum. He's unbelievably knowledgeable about the forest down there. And, and for these 100 species, we saw this very well-predicted uh, or expected trade-off between growth rate of productivity and persistence, shown here as survival, for these 100 or so species. And we measured not necessarily the leaf traits we wanted to measure, but the easy ones to measure. We found that two traits explain 40% of, of the entire variation in growth and mortality of these 100 species over 25 years, uh, where the species that have uh, dense wood or dense leaves, literally, uh, per vol unit volume of a lot of carbon in them, are slow growing but long lived as individuals, and the species with the um, Fast tissue are uh, not dense, uh, have a high growth rate and low survival. So we see that these leaf traits well explain much of what goes on in this forest, and there's been examples of this in many other systems. I like this example because it's one of the best characterized ecosystems which we've tested these ideas in. I'm not going to show up, we also see that leaf trait variation explains soil biochemical processes, including changes in cation exchange capacity and changes in nitrogen cycling. So, at least talk a little bit about some of the grounding and concepts in theory. Now I'm going to spend most of the time talking about experiments, observations, and models. There's three different ways of trying to understand something about the way our ecosystems are changing uh, in today's world. Now I've been involved in it and led many of these in experiments, ecosystem scale experiments that vary CO2, nitrogen, warm uh, temperature, rainfall, uh, biodiversity, um, plant invasion, and fire. We're going to talk about three of these, I think, in the next little while, including doing experiments where we vary microbes, not just plant diversity, and in, in which we vary worm, earthworms as well as plant invasions. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can experimentally test ideas at the scale of an ecosystem. Uh, some more easier than others, and this one is not easy. This is an experiment that's now in its 11th year called Before Warmed. It's a warming experiment, a climate change experiment in Minnesota's boreal forest uh, at a site outside of Duluth and one near Ely near the Canadian border. Uh, Rebecca Montgomery and our Tristan Pansky have been among close collaborators on this. This is an experiment in which we warm 72 uh, 10 foot uh, diameter plots uh, across two sites. Uh, there's two habitats, half the plots are in the open, half in the understory. Three temperatures, ambient, whoops, plus 1.7 and plus 3.4 degrees. And in, in most of these plots, uh, excuse me, in all the plots, we have uh, planted individuals of five species that are boreal, spruce fir, jack pine, aspen, and uh, paper birch, whose northern range limit goes quite far into Canada, and southern range limit goes into the northern United States, so central states, and also five southern temperate species, which co-occur in northern Minnesota, but are, are not, uh, are very low densities there, and whose northern range limit literally is right near the U.S. Canadian border, but grow much further south. And as our hypothesis was not rocket science, was that with warming, these species near their warmer range limits would do poorly, and these species would do better. Uh, this experiment is the only one in the world that warms both above ground and below ground in open air. And there's infrared uh, lamps above ground above one of those 72 plots. Here's one of the plots in the fall when you can see snow has fallen elsewhere. And the other plots have suggested that the planting warm plots still are green and the snow has melted there. So I could spend all the time talking about results in this study, but I'm just going to in one slide here give you three of the results. Uh, the two red ones are ones which are uh, ones in which the outcome are not necessarily unexpected but are bad for, for sustainability of Earth. And the green one is slightly better. So the first one is that boreal species as predicted are at risk. The spruce and fir in particular are growing poorly and, and 
dying faster under warming. Um, the oaks and maples do better, but in the real world, there aren't lots of oaks and maples right there. And without assisted migration, they may not get there fast enough to replace their spruce and fir. Uh, so our forest integrity might be at risk. And we talked about this in a paper several years ago. The second example is a little uh, more complicated physiologically. And that is that metabolic acclimation of respiration dampens carbon loss of the atmosphere. If you remember from biology class, as temperatures rise, the metabolic respiration from plants or animals increases quasi-exponentially. Um, so there's a lot of concern that with climate change, that would lead to runaway CO2 return to the atmosphere from respiration. But just like if you go to high elevation, uh, after a few days you adjust, you acclimate to the low oxygen availability, plants adjust uh, their respiration and metabolism to temperatures every few days that quickly and that actually maintains a bit of homeostasis so they release less CO2 to the atmosphere than we expected. Only 20% as much as, as would have, we would have thought otherwise. So that's kind of good news. Still, with warming they release more CO2 but it's not going to be a runaway release of CO2 to the atmosphere. The third finding um, was that warmer means drier with adverse consequences. So this experiment is in a part of the world that's relatively mesic. Soils, we get rain all summer long. There's some periods without rain, the soil gets a bit dry. But because the under warmer temperatures, with the same amount of moisture in the air, the evaporative demand is higher, plants and soils dry out faster. And also in, in the real world as climate is changing, we're getting more rain in the spring and winter, less in late summer, and those rain events are, the rain is falling in larger events, so there's bigger times between rain events when soil can dry. So all that collectively means that even with the same total annual rainfall, the soils are functionally and the plants are effectively drier in midsummer uh, in, the, in the future, and that's what we see in our experiment. And on the two-thirds of the days where the soils are drier, which doesn't mean they're very dry, but if you just divide all the days of the growing season up, two-thirds of the drier days, that soil dryness reduces photosynthesis more than warming increases it, even if it's in the spring or fall when the temperatures are low. And so uh, in this experiment, and this is, results are similar to some global models that other groups have done, that warmer conditions, even in places that seem like they should be relatively cool and in which warmer temperatures might benefit them by extending the growing season and warming up cool times of day in the midsummer, that even modestly drier soils have a big impact on carbon. The next experiment I'm talking about uh, is on the other side of the world and at Western Sydney University in Australia. It's led by Dave Ellsworth, and it's the world's only uh, free air CO2 enrichment experiment in mature woodland or forest. The trees are 80 feet tall or 27 meters high. Um, so this experiment costs about $20 million to build. It's very expensive. Uh, that's why it's the only experiment of its kind in the world. And it's a strange experiment because we set out to test the hypothesis that the plants wouldn't respond pretty much at all to elevated CO2. Um, and I'll say why this is worth doing, why it's been worth spending $20 million on it. Uh, this gets back to one of those theoretical underpinnings I was talking about, ecological stoichiometry. In a super simplistic way of thinking about plants, if the ratio of leaf carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus is skewed um, so that there's relatively more nitrogen and phosphorus relative to carbon, but not in absolute terms, then we think of that as carbon limited. In essence, the plant needs both C and NTP to build its molecular structure. And if there's uh, more nitrogen and phosphorus than it needs, then it's carbon limited and we respond a lot to CO2. If in a relative sense, the nitrogen is limited, this is 1% tissue nitrogen. When the phosphorus is low, this is 0.1% uh, phosphorus, then we think that those systems are more limited by nitrogen and phosphorus than carbon, and that this should have an impact on CO2 fertilization. And before this Uke face experiment, all the elevated CO2 experiments were done in the temperate zone under nitrogen-limited systems. The Earth system models all assume that plants have all the nitrogen and phosphorus they want, and that plants are going to continue to increase the photosynthesis and growth under elevated CO2 and maintain that large carbon sink I talked about. Our prediction here was that in this very phosphorus Oops, my next slide. Both 
nitrogen and phosphorus limited or predominantly phosphorus limited system that plants would already have all the carbon they needed and that they wouldn't really build more biomass with elevated CO2. And that's where I see here where the plant chemical traits can predict their response. And here's the six uh, rings with canopy crane, the lower researchers in canopy to measure uh, insects on the leaves as well as photosynthesis and many other things. Um, and what we found was exactly what we predicted. Well, actually, it was, it was more than we predicted. We thought there'd be a very small positive response. We saw no positive response to biomass growth over the first three years, and the same thing now over five years. Um, the ambient bars shown here on the left, the elevated CO2, the darker ones to the right of each of them, in each of the three years, no, no inkling of an elevated CO2 response at all. So the take home message here is that mature phosphorus in the forest does not enhance its carbon sink under rising CO2. That's kind of depressing news if we're depending on the forest. And they were thinking before Australia changed its government a number of years back, paying farmers and uh, landowners to sequester uh, carbon in their trees and soil. And they were assuming that there'd be enhanced carbon uptake. So this changes those equations. We're talking about that at lunch a little bit. Uh, now, this is a cartoon diagram of the world's rainforest, the vast majority of which are tropical, subtropical, other than some up here and down here. Um, and most of those are phosphorus limited. So, and they're not quite as phosphorus limited as this eucalyptus forest, but if they're phosphorus limited, it might mean they have a very low carbon sink strength, meaning that the tropical forests won't be able to increase their productivity under high CO2 and sequester more carbon. Now, there's been observational studies that claim that global greening is going on in higher LAI and that it's attributed to elevated CO2. So different kinds of evidence aren't necessarily in agreement. So we don't really know exactly. You can't take this one experiment and extrapolate it everywhere. Uh, but there are no other experiments in the phosphorus limited tropics to test with this holds elsewhere. The last uh, experiment I want to talk about here is uh, involves fire. Uh, we don't really think of fire as being something we play with experimentally. Maybe play is a good word. There's a little bit of a uh, pyromaniac in all of us. But I've been part of an experiment started by people well before I got to Minnesota. Uh, 50 years of prescribed fire in Minnesota Oak Savannah, uh, over several hundred hectares, uh, and a variety of different fire frequencies. But we threw that data together with data from 47 other experiments in a project led by Adam Pellegrini, uh, who's currently at Stanford, uh, to look at the way in which long-term fire would influence soil processes, in particular accumulation of carbon and nitrogen, what that meant for both carbon and nitrogen cycling. And the orange dots show the location of all these experiments, which all ran from 9 to 65 years, so they're, they're the largest and longest running fire experiments on the planet. And what we found in this paper that came out in Nature last year is that fire uh, releases nitrogen uh, from the system, both because it volatilizes in gas, but also it washes away in, in runoff. Um, and that the, because nitrogen boosts productivity, the loss of nitrogen over time from fire, and the results in the experiment I'm not showing you, showed that they had less nitrogen the more fire they had. Uh, that decreases carbon cycling and biomass production everywhere according to the LPJ guess model. All these colors are all sh showing losses. Um, and that's bad news because it suggests that in addition to the direct loss of carbon from fire, that indirect effects of fire and soil processes further suppress carbon cycling and carbon storage. So not only do you lose carbon right away, you degrade soil with fire, especially repeated fire, and that lowers the potential to gain more carbon stored in the future. So, we talked about concepts in theory and how they might underpin experiments, observations, and models. We talked about some of the experiments. Now I'm going to talk about some what I'm calling macroecological observations. These are uh, studies where we use data rather than doing experiments. I'm going to call macroecological the ones I'm talking about were done largely at regional or global scales. And I've been involved in these at both forests and grasslands at a number of scales with a number of different 
attributes from traits of leaves, which are wood, to abundance and composition of community, uh, to biomass and soil processes at the ecosystem scale. The one I'm going to focus on mostly is a relatively new initiative called the Global Forest Biodiversity Initiative, which I began with uh, Jing Ding Liang, who's really the, the leader of this, and Tom Crowther. Jing Ding is now at Purdue University, and Tom is at uh, ETH in Zurich. Uh, and this initiative basically got forest inventory data, like the FIA data, from as many countries around the world as we could. The difficulty here is that every country has different rules about access to that data and how you use the data. And it was really a political challenge and, and hurdle more than anything to get this data together. But now there's data from more than 1.2 million plots in seven countries. And we can ask a lot of questions with this. And one of them I actually put in the uh, blurb about this talk, which is like, well, how many tree species are there on Earth? This actually doesn't directly relate to the answer, but I love this diagram. I didn't make this diagram. It shows the relative uh, abundance or frequency of current of the most common species in all of these different uh, continents based on this data. I, I like to, I'd like to put this up on my wall, but my wife probably wouldn't believe it. Uh, anyway, so I want to ask you, how many species, anyone hazard a guess, how many tree species do you think there are on Earth? No guess is wrong, so we don't know the answer, but uh, just hazard a guess. I mean, any wild ideas. 3,000. 3,000. Anyone else hazard? 40,000, okay, going up like an auction. <laughs> Anyone higher, even lower. Those are, those are reasonable guesses. Um, I'm not sure I would have had any idea before we started this. Well, because we have so many plots and so much data, we're able to use um, estimators of, of uh, species richness from these. And we don't just use like species sample curves or species area curves. This, there's something that's derived from actually uh, deciphering uh, uh, decoded messages in World War II, uh, something called a Chow Chu estimator, which uses the number of, of singletons in your total samples and the number of doubletons and the ratio and how that changes to estimate how many are missing. And so what you have here is actually our best estimate is there's 95,000 tree species in the world. Right now we know of 64,000. And so this method tells you there's 31,000 undiscovered. Um, both half of the discovered and undiscovered species are in South America, and the rest roughly even be between North America and Fox. We lag, we're not number one, we're the number last. Um, uh, Eurasia, Oceania, Africa, and then in North America. <coughs> the curves for each of those. Um, now you might say, well, this is just a curiosity. Why do we really care about how many species there are? Well, all of the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals and every other kind of sustainable development goal wants us to preserve biodiversity. Trees are better understood than most taxa. We don't even have any idea how many trees there are. How do you know how many you've lost? And so having a baseline for what actually exists on the planet seems like a useful thing to know. But what about geographic patterns? Rather than just accumulating all the species on Earth and counting them, we've also um, taken it and used machine learning to calculate the number of tree species in every three by three kilometer grid cell on land on Earth. Um, this paper led by Jing Ying Liang recently submitted, it's in review. Uh, and then we made these maps uh, now of species richness and species evenness. Now, uh, kind of sparse sampling around the world. We know that the tropics have more species than the high latitudes, that's not a surprise. Although until now we've had no decent map of that at, at any kind of resolution like this. What to me is just as interesting in the purpler colors are high and green colors are low, is that when we look at evenness, um, it's actually the reverse. The tropics actually have cooler colors, green colors of lower evenness than the temperate boreal forests. And what this means is really that the tropics, and this is something that's been discovered in the last 10 or 15 years, are really dominated by hyper-dominant species. Most tropical forests, even if they have 300 species, two or three that make up like 98% of all the stems might not work out, so don't, don't do the math on me. And the rest are made up of those other several hundred species, um, which might all be present as one or two individuals. Whereas if you go out 100 miles from here and in a forest, you're going to have a mix of duck fir, tenon forest, and, and maple, and uh, spruce, and they'll, they'll all be present in some intermediate level. So the tropics are strange in that they're dominated in terms 
the number of species by really rare species, but the forests are actually dominated by very few species. So in terms of evenness, the tropical forests are actually less diverse than the temperate boreal forests. Now, counting up what species are aware on the Earth is interesting, uh, again, as baseline data. But of course, we're worried about this because we're worried about losing species. And although we're using the GFBI data to try to look at that, I'm going to show data from just the Atlantic Forest region in Brazil in a completely separate study uh, led by Dr. Cesar Leal, who was a former PhD student of mine, uh, in which under both the business as usual climate scenario and the mitigation scenario, the vast majority of species have a smaller area of suitable habitat. So they, the climate change in combination with land use reduce the potential area of occupancy. Uh, this is more pronounced the smaller the range size of the species, and so we can predict kind of these changes in this pretty well-known tropical forest, the Atlantic forest region, which is quite developed also. But the main take of message here is that we're seeing a loss of suitable area, which is going to likely mean fewer species in any given forest and more species going extinct locally, regionally, or even globally. So that's why we're worried about this and why it's good to know how many species there are in the first place. And the reason that this loss of species matters uh, gets back to uh, diversity. And here, uh, from a paper a couple years ago, using the GFBI data, we looked at forest productivity um, against the relative species riches, where you looked at, this is 100, it's hard to see this, as given forest at either 80%, 60 40 20 or 10% of the maximum for its uh, biome in similar soil, similar climate, forest productivity is lost according to this uh, curve, which actually is almost identical to the curve we see for biodiversity, ecosystem function in grassland and forest experiments where we plant different levels of diversity in one small area. So this relationship between uh, biodiversity and ecosystem function really seems to hold globally. And if we only look at the harvested timber products, ignore all the other ecosystem services, whether they're monetized or not, just the timber alone, this is a two to three hundred billion dollar service annually, biodiversity. Uh, we're looking at diverse plots versus what they'd be if they were monoculture. So we depend on this for natural resources and for our economy, and so loss of forest productivity anywhere on Earth is also going to be uh, a big deal and is happening today. And trying to tie the diversity back to the global change even more is working with a uh, Han Chen at Lakehead University and his students, uh, we saw from data from Western Canada that, and I won't, these are too complicated to walk you through, but that species rich boreal forests actually grew more and had less mortality than species poor forests under environmental change in the past half century. So we tried to tease apart <coughs> rising CO2, increasing drought, increasing temperature, and then in all of those, the forests from these inventory data in Canada that were more diverse. Uh, we're more resilient in the face of climate change. And so we see an indicator here from the statistical treatment of this observational data that trade diversity in existing forests helps make them resilient in the face of, of changing the environment. Well, the last part of the story about uh, my scientific work I'm going to talk about involves models, and in particular simulation models. Uh, the world of Earth system and land surface modeling is a complete alphabet soup. Uh, these are five of the most common global uh, models, global in extent models, except for PNM, a regional model. Uh, that these are run by the Australian science community, uh, a number of European uh, countries. Uh, this is a DOE and US community model, and LPJDS is also another, another uh, European uh, model. Uh, now, we're all familiar with models in everyday life. We think of them as their idealized or simplified or downsized representation of, of something. And they induce us to perceive something essential about it. The model could be a toy railroad or it could be a Google map, which allows you to, to think about how you might get from A to B. It's not actually landscape in, in loons, but it is a representation of it. And our global carbon cycle model is the same thing. They basically take our ideas about the structure and function of ecosystems and how that varies globally, and the drivers and the way carbon moves around and makes this uh, statistical representation of it. 
And the reason that I'm bringing this up today and I, I'm interested in working on this is that when we go back to this model of what happens to the global carbon cycle, this downward arrow, which is the land ecosystems absorbing extra carbon that we put in the air, uh, we need to know whether it's going to continue. And these models are one way of looking at whether or not that's likely to occur and whether or not this trillion dollar ecosystem service is going to persist. So what is the state of knowledge? Now for people who do global carbon cycle work or land modeling, um, oh, let me back up for a second. It's a one or two slides about land surface models. Because I'm going to show how challenging the results of these models are, I wanted to also talk about how incredible they are. Because th these are just simply a model. It's amazing that anyone ever had the gumption to build one of these. Because these land surface models deal with processes they have to quantitatively account for all the physics of surface fluxes of energy and light. They also have to deal with every aspect of hydrology that occurs on a given ecosystem and all the biology and biochemistry that goes on. And so that's hard to do for a piece of land the size of this room. Doing it for every square centimeter of land on Earth is a pretty mind-boggling challenge. And this is what those models show. This uh, an updated paper, 2014, by Friedland's done it all, a quite famous paper from about eight years before, comparing the leading global land service model. This is the annual land flux. So this is the carbon sink on land um, over time. And the models kind of just uh, kind of agree on historical land sink. They differ some, but they're all in the same ballpark. Uh, but then when they try to model the future, they disagree hopefully not hopelessly, on the future land sink, with the extreme outliers uh, either showing a sink strength the size of our current fossil fuel emissions, or a source the size of the fossil fuel emissions. And if it's the source, it means we have twice, you know, when we get to the 2100, we have twice the carbon emissions because the Earth's lands are giving back so much carbon to the atmosphere. Um, now, which of these is right? No one knows. The models actually are remarkably similar in all of their logic and parameterization, and yet they come up with these dramatically different outcomes because of the complexity of the models. And what I believe is over-complexity. Um, and the reason that they agree well here is they're tuned. Um, you don't get your papers published if your model doesn't somewhat agree with all the other models. Uh, but you can't tune it to the future. And so um, the models disagree much more when we look into our territory. So why are these predictions so uncertain in the future? Well, there's many reasons. I'm just going to talk about four here. Poor parameterization, and what I mean by that is the model basically has to tell you what the vegetation is and what its chemistry is and what the soil is for every grid cell on Earth. Inadequate core physiology, I'll talk briefly about this in a minute. Uh, the models don't do a good job about the effects of CO2 and climate change and other global change effects and especially their interactions. And then many other human impacts are included in them, things like loss of biodiversity, wildfire, uh, human management, land effects uh, aren't in these models at all. And this, for me, helps reinforce the challenge of these models is that E3SM, which is the model I am involved in, that, that's a derivative of CLM 4.5, has 54,000 vegetated grid cells on Earth and it calculates the carbon flux for each of those every 30 minutes every day of the year. So there's a billion estimates to get right or wrong each year. So it's just an enormous uh, challenge. And I'm going to give just two examples of work we're involved in that try to, to advance this. And there's <coughs> dozens of groups around the world doing this. We're not the only ones doing this. Um, but the, the first example here involves the parameterization of the vegetation types. So, Land surface models treat all leaves of a given plant functional type as if they were identical. And there's usually between 4 and 14 plant functional types across the world. So in essence, they take all the tropical rainforests and say they all have the same leaf size, shape, and chemistry. Um, now, we know that's not true. So the idea is, can we do better? And one of the projects we've been involved in is taking the uh, leaf trait data from this tri-global network and with machine learning, and this is work led by my postdoc, Ethan Butler, uh, 
use Bayesian spatial models to create uh, map, uh, maps of leaf nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, leaf mass barrier, leaf lifespan, and other traits uh, at a 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer uh, grid cell across the world. And not just look at the mean, but also create this, the distribution of those traits, because we think those trait distributions matter. Uh, and then put them into this E3SM land model and see whether the uh, updated leaf parameterization means or use of those distributions change the model outcome. And of course they change the model outcome, and this is something I've had every time we've worked with land surface models. As soon as you, this is unequivocally better uh, parameterization the model breaks. Because these models with, I think I took the slide out, there's 25,000 pages of code. Uh, there's unbelievable complexity in ways in which different aspects of the model interact, in ways that no one can understand. So if you change lever one on the model, something changes at the other end, you have no idea what happened in the middle. Uh, I was talking to, maybe it was with Abby earlier today, that if someone gave me, someone asked me this question after I gave a talk at Berkeley Lab, someone gave me like $100 million to, to work on land surface models, what would I do? And I would basically uh, give the model to a group of people who would start from scratch and make the model that had the fewest terms and the fewest uh, parameters in it so that you actually understood when you tweak lever one, something changed, what actually happened. Because we spent years, literally years, figuring out when we changed the model it breaks, what other thing was wrong with it that compensated for the wrong thing we fixed in the first place. The other example uh, involves plant respiration and temperature relationships. Now most models ignore really poorly represent these relationships at all relevant temporal and spatial scales. I'm going to give one example of, of and this matters because the flux just from plants back to the uh, atmosphere each year in respiration is six times the size of our anthropogenic carbon emission. So a small change in this flux is big relative to how we're changing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So I was involved in a project in which we used uh, seven, uh, 18 sites and seven biomes, 231 species around the world, to look at whether the temperature response of leaf respiration uh, was the same across biomes of plant functional types. This is work led by uh, Owen Atkin and uh, Mary Hessel, who's the lead postdoc on the project in the paper a couple years ago. And what we found was this a universal shape of this short-term temperature response curve of respiration. If you remember back to your uh, college or high school biology, the kind of exponential rise uh, that equates to a fixed Q10, well, a fixed Q10 would be a log linear relationship. What we see in every case is that this is a log polynomial where to get higher temperatures, actually, the increase, proportional increase in respiration falls off. And this, is, this shape is conserved in all species and all locations. Not exactly the same, but it's very similar. And all the models, uh, none of the models include this. Uh, and so when we actually put this in the Jules land model and work led by Chris Hutchingford, uh, there's some pretty profound implications for the global carbon cycle. We also changed some of the other respiration algorithms in this. But by incorporating greater realism, it increased projected future respiration from 2015 to 2020. Uh, all, everywhere on Earth had an increase. But the redder areas for the higher increase, and not surprisingly, the, the warmer and more productive parts of the world. This is bad news for the model global carbon cycle to suggest that, that there'd be less sink strength because more of the carbon is being released in the future when we improve the, the respiration compared to the default model that exists now. So, kind of a whirlwind uh, tour of at least what I've been involved in in terms of trying to understand how nature is changing, or at least the terrestrial land part of nature is changing on our changing planet. Um, so, you know, I've done science. Uh, we've used a variety of, of tools to look at what's happened to nature, and some of the things we found, you know, include the fact that trait generality seems to be a useful approach to understanding ecology. Biodiversity matters, and we're losing it. Ecosystem health is, is threatened by climate change and other global change. Carbon cycling, uh, the carbon sink strength may be smaller than we expected it to be, and certainly smaller than we hoped it would be. And then complexity, rain, that we spend a lot of time on this, but then 
most of our ecosystem experiments have multiple factors, and there's often really complex interactions between drivers such as temperature, CO2, nitrogen, biodiversity, in a way that make it hard for these global models to actually get that right. Now, we're only a tiny fraction of the global uh, community working on climate change, and if you look at the broader diagnosis of the thousands of people studying climate change in all systems, you know, this is from the IPCC, the list of all the things we know are happening and that have impacts on the ecosystem. You've seen all of these things before, rising seas, coastal flooding, rainfall deluges, flooding, hurricanes, droughts, uh, tree death and wildfire, oceans acidifying and warming, and, and increasingly more and more attention paid to human health, which is a big social justice issue because it's poorest people in the world who are going to suffer from heat waves, disease, and pollution, and the like. So, what about the other half of the, the scenario I was trying to talk about, which is using science to make a difference? Well, under, uh, unlike the green check mark I gave myself for doing science, I give myself a red X here because you know, I haven't been successful in stopping climate change. Is anyone else in this room? Uh, I don't think so. Um, and so I think it's very important and, and, uh, that I do this kind of work, whether it's successful or not, at least I'm attempting through teaching and outreach and citizen engagement to teach the broader world about all these four steps in climate science 101, that's warming, it's up, it's bad, but we can fix it. Um, and I do that in a variety of ways, and each of us can do this in our own different ways, and not everyone has to do it, but I think many of us, or most of us should do it. One of the things I'm involved in is something called the Climate Science Rapid Response Team. We started this about eight years ago, so that if a media or political group wanted scientific information about a topic that was up in the news, we would get them feedback right away, and um, there's a roster of 160 people, so that if something in the news that says, oh, a certain hurricane's gonna hit Alabama, you know, you can talk to a, 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 a scientist and, and say whether or not that seems to be accurate or not. Um, I've also uh, done something for the Climate Defense Project, which actually, is, is it headquartered here in Seattle, or is it in somewhere else in the Northwest? Um, and they've been defending what are called valve turners who've gone and shut down pipelines um, to be arrested so that they could actually make something called a necessity defense in court, which says that because we're failing to stop climate change, um, they have the right um, to shut down the pipeline. Now, I was not saying whether or not I thought that was illegal or ethically true, but I was willing to testify that climate change is real and has having all these negative impacts in Minnesota and around the rest of the world. I'm also on the board of the, uh, one of the environmental groups in Minnesota called the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, which is uh, the environmental group that has the biggest legal um, uh, roster to actually use legal means to try to uh, influence, cajole, and when necessary, litigate against the state and business and industry, uh, everything from mining to, to, we actually got the state to include a, uh, a social cost of carbon increase in a couple of years ago for the state utilities. The other thing I do is actually uh, part of a YouTube channel called Minute Earth that uh, my two sons and I started uh, with a team of other people that uh, now has more than 2 million subscribers and 300 million views around the world. We have about 170 videos, they're two to three minutes long. They try to teach your average five-year-old or 95-year-old or anyone in between uh, about a range of topics from climate change to sustainability to human health, geology, geography, etc. In, in short uh, and fun and funny videos. You know, do these 300 million views actually change anything about whether we're going to be more sustainable in the future? I have no idea, um, but it's not even saw this, we, we hope. So, um, and you can check on this here, this one here if you're interested. So, anything I do as a scientist or as a private citizen, is it a single bullet to, to helping us get on the wrong track? No, because there is no single bullet. Um, there are things, of course, we can all do, and I'm sure you've all seen lists like this before. What can I do as a citizen? Vote, volunteer, activate, be more efficient with your uh, uh, household and, and travel, 
less food waste, plant-rich diet, drive violence, and as Ekman mentioned, the scientists we are guilty, guilty, guilty for here, especially. Uh, and I tried to get ESA to have every other meeting be a cyber meeting, and it went nowhere a few years ago. I should try again um, to save to save uh, carbon. But just as important as what I can do as an individual is what we can do as a society. And uh, you mentioned John Foley, who's now head of uh, Project Drawdown. There, there's many organizations like this. But this is one that I think is doing a really good job of trying to find and publicize solutions to reverse global warming. And they rank uh, 100 different ways in terms of their potential efficacy. Some of them are exactly what you expect, but some are not. Number one on the entire list was refrigerant management. How many, put your hand up if you would have picked that. No one. Basically, when you take your old refrigerator, it goes to the dump, and eventually that leaks out. Those hillocarbons basically are really potent greenhouse gases. And so that's actually the number one uh, most cost effective and biggest impact we can make is to, is to hold on to that refrigerator. You know, number two is something you would expect to see high unless wind energy. Three and four, reduce food waste, go to a plant rich diet. Number five, I'm going green because many of us in the world work on farms. That's <coughs> high on the list. Six and seven, are really interesting. They're about <coughs> girls empowering women, family planning life, um, because when women have more control over their lives um, and have more power, they help make decisions about their life, their family life, that not only good for them and their families, but in the long run, uh, waste less energy and use less energy, including having fewer people on the planet. Um, number 60 to 100, I just put a few in here to show that there's many, many, it's not just a hundred ways of doing this, it's probably a thousand. And no one of them by themselves is going to make all the change, but together they, <coughs> they can and we can do it. Now people often at some point say, well, but won't it cost too much? Because the estimated cost to stop climate change, not just slow it down, but to stop it, uh, over the next 30 years would be $74 trillion. Now once money gets more than a billion, you know, it's like what's trillions, billions, but billions, it's all a lot. So that's what seems like a heck of a lot of money. But I have put all the rest of the financial or economic data in kind of percentages of global GDP. Because I can kind of relate to that. So I'm going to think about the last two slides here. The benefits and costs to keep climate warming less than 2 degrees C. Uh, well, the benefits, and this is agreed on by mainstream economists now, and actually the people who worry about this actually have much more draconian numbers, is that if we keep warming less than 2 C, we avoid a 4 to 8% hit on the global GDP. Meaning if we allow CO2 to keep rising and other greenhouse gases, and we temperatures rise more than 2 degrees C, we have a 4 to 8% reduction in global GDP, which is more bigger than it sounds. Like the global depression, it goes down about that or, or less. The cost, well, it could cost us that 74 trillion, it could cost us as much as 3% of global GDP, um, or it could save as much as 3% of global GDP, because in fact, tied up in that $74 trillion cost is that if you switch to renewables, it's gonna, you're going to actually save money because renewables like wind and solar are already cost competitive compared to coal and, and oil today. And it's going to increasingly, they're going to increasingly become more cost effective. And so actually, even ignoring the damages, we might actually be 3% better off in terms of global GDP in the future um, by, by switching. So the worst case scenario, and these numbers are of course estimates of lots of uncertainty around it, but is that the worst case is that it costs us 3% of GDP to stop climate change, but we get a 4% benefit, so that's a 1% improvement. The best case is that we save money by doing it, and we have an 8% benefit in, in eliminating those negative implications, which is a huge 11% impact. So the choices we face are we stop climate change, which is a one plus one plus eleven percent benefit to the global economy, and preserve the planet as an added benefit. Or do we do nothing about climate change, which will cost us between one and eleven percent uh, negative impact on the economy, and also have a damaged planet? So the conclusion to, that I make is that the economic range of outcomes alone not only says we should stop climate change, but will actually lead us to stop climate change. Self-interest or if you want greed, 
is what's going to save us from climate change. Uh, you know, Greta Thunberg is great in making the ethical arguments about why we should be stopping climate change, and I totally agree with them. And I think that actually global culture will move in that direction. But at the same time, the fact that actually businesses, countries, societies will be better off economically by changing and stopping climate change, that's what will change things. Now, it would be better if this change happened tomorrow or last year or 20 years ago than in 10 years, but it's better if it happens starting 10 years than never happening. And I think that it's inevitable that we actually will do this. Now, there'll be lots of suffering along the way. I said the poorest people in the world will be able to suffer the most. Uh, lots of things about nature we love will take a hit. But nature's resilient, more resilient than I think the human society. Nature will be okay in the long run, whether we will be or not, kind of depends on whether we actually make these changes. So, you know, setting a talk about understanding and stewarding nature, uh, talk about my role as a scientist, but then also how I think about my role as a scientist, as a professor and a citizen, and whether or not I'm making positive change and how I could do it. Still a big question mark. I, I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing or enough of it, uh, but I'm not sure what to do and that there's lots of debate going on. And I think we need to take, as scientists and as professors, and as grad students and postdocs, we need to take our role as global citizens as importantly as we take our role in the latest course or the latest scientific paper writing seriously. Uh, it doesn't fit neatly within the, the rule structure and the benefit and the uh, way in which we run our, our academic enterprises, but I think that's something we all need to take on. And I think it, with that, I've probably more than run out of time, and thanks for your attendance. I'm happy to take questions or comments. Question for Peter. Far away. So uh, there was a little mention of sort of disease and insects and this whole thing, and global warming is likely to increase the activity of those things. How does that kind of influence all the conclusions that you come up with? That's Pat, no. Um, <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's entirely consistent in the sense that many of the changes that are occurring have other negative feedbacks, and in this sense I mean negative in the sense of they're ones that we don't want, not that they're quantitatively negative. And insects are one of them. Basically, we have invasive species, we get insect pests. If we have droughts and the trees are more vulnerable to insects, then the insects become uh, more abundant, kill more trees, that leads to more fires. You know, it's a bad cycle. And so you're right, that's an important thing. Uh, it only makes kind of the conclusions about what's happening in nature uh, more dire. Is that a word, more dire? Can you say dire or? <laughs> sounds bad. Behind you. So, uh, it's a, uh, 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 there's a specific question. So there's a, a slide which pretty sure the tree diversity uh, comparison between the uh, tropics and the uh, region. And you mentioned that the tree diversity is much uh, uh, smaller compared in the tropics compared to the country. Tree, tree evenness, not the, the richness is much, much higher in the tropics. So, uh, is there a reason why the evenness is uh, smaller? Is it more uh, related to the, uh, to the um, uh, growth kinetics or to the metabolism? Is there a certain theory behind it? That's a great question. Um, we hadn't gotten there in our work, and maybe someone else's, well, probably couldn't have thought about it, because I'm not sure this has been really uh, shown before. I have to think about that a little bit in terms of what it is that would lead to the hyperdominance of the most dominant species. I think I have a notion of why if you have so many rare species, I mean so many species, obviously if you have 500 species in a hectare forest versus 30, all 500 can't be very abundant. So there's a mathematical reason why some have to be rare. Um, but the fact that the most common ones are even more common than you expect totally by random chance is really intriguing. I don't have a, a good answer on why. I think the first paper that really talked about hyperdominance was by Hans Tersteg, maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, but I don't think they 
necessarily address your question either, but I have to go back and read it and see if they did it. So you can think about it, write a paper about it. Because I, 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 because I actually try to apply things like on the macro ecology, like trees on microbes, to see if the same theories apply or they don't apply. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to see the answer so that I can try to oh, apply it to my So a good question is whether in the tropics, whether the, the bacteria and fungi would also be highly dominant with yes. wort? I have no idea. <laughs> you have a slide for the Atlantic forest, and I had a question about that had to do with the mitigation and land use impacts. I, if I recall, there's like what, approximately 5% of the Atlantic forest remaining of what the original range was before Portuguese so could you just explain like if that is the remaining five percent or what that yeah, graph is not based on the original forest this okay. is like as if you went into the eastern north america in north carolina and sent the forests that were there and so it's of the existing trees so okay yeah and i think there's a little more than five percent yeah i wasn't i know it's yeah. forest but i think it may be 20 or 30 percent that would be that would be good <laughs> Doug. You're saying that the models have one set of traits for the uh, tropical rainforest. The, the, some of the data you showed suggests there's a great variety of traits within that tropical rainforest. Yeah. One would expect that selection or increase in CO2 would eventually change the mix of traits so that the average will change. Yeah. Do the models have any Potential, or the data you have, have any potential well, of getting a handle on that? I assume you talked to Abby. She mentioned that she does a lot of this morning, this work, doing exactly that, testing that. Your model. Did you know that? Um, who's not here? I think she said she couldn't. Oh, yeah, she's right here. Yeah. yeah. But I haven't asked her about that. Okay. Um, so she's doing that in her, in her models right now. And so, and we talked a bit about whether or not actually the mean trait would change. It probably depends on which trait. Uh, she's been changing leaf mass per area in her models, which we weren't quite sure whether it would change uniformly. With elevated CO2, you'd expect nitrogen concentration to change because you know from experiments that 99 times out of 100 percent nitrogen goes down. So you'd be pretty safe in, in well, as safe as you ever are, in modeling that that trait would on average decrease. Um, whether the spread of traits among tax in a community would change is much more challenging because we don't have a good handle. None of the models I talk about look at vegetation in a dynamic fashion. And as again we talked about this morning, because all plants photosynthesize the same way and grow and move water roughly the same way, as hard as it is to model regions and globe and the globe uh, from a carbon cycle standpoint, trying to model the compositional change is much harder because there's so many more degrees of freedom about how plants interact and move into that. I'm not sure that quite answered your question. Mm -hmm. okay. That um, suitable habitat and the change trap, yeah, it is kind of striking how much loss there is and this kind of the lack of balance. You lose your habitat, but you can know, turn gain more somewhere else. Do you think that's mostly because of novel climates or the suitable habitat was created out there? Change climate and occupy by some kind of landscape. That's a com combination. And that, that's a very, you know, because the data is coarse, it's a very coarse model, like as any model that kind is. Um, but in part because you're, it's going to get warmer. So the plants that exist there are, are, are suited to certain kinds of conditions. Well, you're going to push into a range that none of them are really suited to. Um, and you're also going to shift the, the in some ways, this is a, a, a slightly more sophisticated climate envelope model, I think, in that sense. Um, but also, some of the, the few species that do gain, gain a lot. So the most abundant and weedy species that already have a large range, at least in this model, are actually going to gain a lot of potential area of occupancy. And it's the species that are smaller range sizes and are rarer now that will tend to lose out and in part, this model does have a spatial element, a very crude one, where you, you're not allowed to jump from the equivalent of, of Seattle to Salt Lake City um, if the climate there is OK. So you have to be somewhat reasonably close. But it's, it's because the winters, in some sense, 
those rare species have more particular requirements. And there's requirements to either disappear or somewhere else far from where they are. But it's it's a it's a pretty coarse model. Tom. Yeah. So paleoecological work has demonstrated that during the Little Ice Age, that species such as bristlecone pine and shanscale co-occur, co and now they're separated by literally thousands of feet. So that, that's using, do those traits actually, so if you take data like that, do, you, do, do your trait models actually say the same thing if you go back in time, take your models back? Anyone from where is she? She can answer the question. I think it's that question. Um, we're talking this morning from the paleoecology advisor. Where is she? Yeah, she's a, she has. Oh, she's a leader? Yeah. Oh, maybe you can answer it. Yeah, I mean, we tend to look deeper in time than uh, I say. But. Yeah. Um, but so I guess I, I'm not sure what aspect of the, I think the tra trade-off relationships would still hold. Um, because remember, in any given community now, you can find a broad spread of traits. Just you can't, uh, in the paper by Sandra Diaz two years ago from the, from the Tri database, AD authors or whatever, we found that if you look at six different traits, including seed size and tree height, and looked at all possible multi-trait volume or possibilities, only 2% of all the possible trait combinations exist, meaning that many, many trait combinations are selected against, assuming that if it doesn't exist, it wasn't selected for, <coughs> suggested there's a strong coordination of these different aspects of, of whether you're a fast or slow plant, and that would likely have held the past, and so it gets back to my answer to Doug a minute ago, is that the individual species that occur, occur that are currently existing together or not, might have existed together in the past or in the future, but that doesn't violate any of these relationships we saw there. They're just kind of shifting. It's a shift of how shady and how cool and how wet it is could lead to those kind of novel, non-analog communities without violating this, which is why it's so hard to, to model that. So we do have some light refreshments in the back, uh, so we can have an opportunity to engage more with Peter in the next hour or so before we go to dinner. So uh, please join me in thanking Peter again.